Well, uh, welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast, the world's longest running medical podcast. And um, today we've got uh, uh, Harry Marquis from uh, Sydney, um, who's going to talk to us about, um, in some ways, combining PET and SPECT. And uh, that's, um, that's a hot topic at the moment. There's the positronium uh, uh, imaging coming out. But I, I think he's going to talk to you something a little bit differently about how to combine PET and SPECT and how to, how to optimise one using the other. And um, I'll start by getting um, Harry to talk a little bit about himself and where he's from and where he works. Okay, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, so my name is Harry um, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Sydney um, at the um, School of Physics. Um, but I conduct my research at the Royal North Shore Hospital uh, under the supervision of Professor Dale Bailey and Dr. Kathy Willison and at University of Sydney, uh, Professor Zdenka Kunchik. Um, so yeah, my background is in um, physics. I studied uh, an undergrad degree in applied physics at UTS. And then I did a master's of medical physics um, at the University of Sydney. And um, now I'm at the end of my PhD um, at the University of Sydney as well. Um, and so my project um, is basically a rough title is um, the development um, of a symmetry platform for theranostic agents. So um, really I started, um, you know, um, at Royal North Shore Hospital, we were involved in the first in-man trial of uh, a novel theranostic pair, which was uh, copper 64 and copper 67 citate. Um, so for somatostatin uh, targeting receptors uh, for neuroendocrine tumours. And this patient cohort was actually patients suffering from unresectable meningioma. Um, but the nice thing about COPPER-64, I'm um, really sort of a holy grail in terms of prospective dissymmetry and radionuclide therapy treatment planning is the um, longer half-life. So a half-life of 12.1 hours. So really allowing for um, sequential imaging at multiple time points, um, so we can get an idea of the pharmacokinetics um, of the individual patient uh, before uh, copper 67 radionuclide therapy, um, you know, as opposed to gallium 68, which has a short half-life. So really you can't do much staging. Um, really what you do is you just demonstrate targeting and then move on to something like uh, a lutetium radio label uh, with lutetium dotatate, for example. Um, so I started off um, looking at uh, voxel-based asymmetry methods um, and actually using the copper 64 data and simulating it as if it was copper 67. Um, and this sort of um, led me to, um, you know, sort of down this path of partial volume correction and, and sort of how large um, the partial volume effect is in SPECT imaging. Um, especially when using medium energy collimators uh, like you do with lutetium-177 and um, copper-67. Um, it's going to be big. So, I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about a, you know, a massive uh, difference in resolution between you know, uh, a spec scanner and a PET scanner and spec scanning with a bad collimator. So you're going to have an effect and the effect's going to vary depending on your lesion size, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, uh, we sort of estimate, um, you know, it's difficult to accurately estimate um, the sort of exact spatial resolution of our spect images, especially because um, the uh, point spread function is uh, spatially variant across the field of view. But if you do some sort of global spatial resolution estimates using a matched filter analysis, like let's say um, you get a ground truth object and you successively blur it until you've got the best match to your spec image, you know we, we've found that the the full width at half maximum um, global spatial resolution of lutetium and copper sixty seven is, is sort of in the you know around eighteen millimeters or or twenty millimeters full width at half maximum. So it's it's massive. Um, yeah, so, you know, partially, I mean, you only really get full recovery of a single pixel value um, if the size of your object is 2.5 times um, larger than the spatial resolution of the imaging system. So, yeah, I mean, any, you know, any lesion under, um, you know, inspect imaging, uh, even lesions three centimetres in diameter, which are quite big, um, are still massively affected by the partial volume effect. Yeah. So, so we... And, yeah, and pet, pet imaging these days, 
you know, on a yeah. really good scanner, you can get, you know, a couple of millimetres, right? So so there's a, there's a big difference between a couple of millimetres and three centimetres, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, but even um, with clinical PET images, you know, you, you, uh, you perform the reconstruction with uh, resolution recovery or point spread function modelling. But, you know, common practice is to apply Gaussian filtering post-reconstruction, further degrading the resolution and, yes. and so on. Uh, so we were uh, really motivated by, um, uh, so Dale Bailey, um, you know, has had a long standing research relationship with Siemens um, and the SPECT um, engineers or software engineers, physicists at Siemens, so Hans Vija and, and people like that. And, um, you know, sort of Dale and I were discussing, you know, um, about this sort of expect bone um, recons they have on Siemens for technetium 99M bone scans. And, um, you know, really you get these sort of really impressive looking um, technetium bone scans. Um, and what they do is that they, uh, they basically segment the CT into various um, zones, uh, depending on the density. And then they reconstruct these zonal maps, um, you know, where they weight towards the bone and, you know, stuff like that. And they end up looking um, pretty impressive, but almost like a painted CT. Um, but we, we were sort of going um, with that idea, um, you know, could we use, you know, if, if your assumption is that, especially with copper, I mean, copper 67, copper 64, they're chemically identical. So you have, you know, you interchange uh, the radio ligands, you know, what you label the pharmaceutical, and in principle, they should be pharmacokinetically identical. Um, so... We, we sort of had this idea that, you know, um, this our copper 67 spec images are really just a worse degraded version of our copper 64 images. Um, and so uh, we were sort of, we were trying to figure out um, how to do this. Um, and then just sort of the stars aligned and the, the, um, the IEEE MIC, Medical Imaging and Computing, I think, um, conference was in Manchester, UK that year. And so Dale reached out to um, Chris Tillmans, Professor Chris Tillmans at, at uh, University College London. And um, yeah, we organised a research exchange visit. So um, I would go to the MIC conference in Manchester and then spend a couple of weeks down in London. Um, so that group is headed by um, Bri Professor Brian Hutton and um, Professor Chris Tillmans. And they've got a great um, team of postdocs and PhD students. Um, and yeah, it was funny. It was, um, you know, it was a great learning experience, but so much was going on. And I remember um, having this sort of meeting with um, Chris Tillmans and a couple of PhD students and a postdoc student, a uh, postdoc researcher. And I didn't know it at the time, but we were basically talking about um, a potential algorithm that I could use. Um, and, you know, so the next day I realized, oh, you know, that meeting was for me, you know, um, and this algorithm was actually, um, it's called the um, HKAM, so Hybrid Kernelized Expectation Maximization Algorithm. And that it was implemented in STIR. So it's been implemented elsewhere. Um, but it was implemented in STIR by Dr. Daniel Daeda, who, um, who now works at the National Physical Laboratory just outside of London. Um, so, so yeah, um, you know, a few days in, just after a few days of being in London, I sort of, um, you know, knew what I had to do and I started playing around with this algorithm and it was, um, you know, almost clear immediately the, the potential um, of some of these reconstructions, basically where, you um, you know, I mean, these reconstructions were developed um, uh, initially sort of for PET reconstructions guided by MR side information. So let's say you have FDG PET, um, let's say low count FDG PET image um, data, and you want um, to reconstruct it um, uh, with, uh, let's say, um, superior noise characteristics or something like that. And you use the MRI image to sort of um, preserve edges where you know edges should be, and then smooth along regions where you expect um, there not to be edges. You right. know, stuff like that. And that's important because there's been significant issues with anatomical a priori reconstructions where they've mislocated if you like uh, activity 
uh, for a pet. Yes. But of course, you're doing something different. You're using something that's fundamentally similar. So it's not like you're going to be biasing it nearly as much, right? Yeah, I mean, that's see, that's the really interesting thing that, you know, the more I think about it is that um, essentially you're looking at the exact same signal, just a, a different sort of quality of it. Um, you're looking at... Um, so instead of using some anatomical modality where, you know, you expect um, there to be some sort of shared information like uptake in one region of the brain, um, like, you know, along some structure, you know, it shouldn't go across the structure, you know, anatomical boundaries, it makes sense. But with this spec reconstruction guided by PET images, um, you're really looking at um, data that should contain the same structures. And 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 almost relatively the same sensitive, uh, the same intensity of those structures. You're you're looking at functional data of the same pharmaceutical, right? Just radio labeled with, right? But you're looking at different temporal space. So, so yes. do you do you sort of bias it more towards the early images where the, where you expect the temporal change to be similar and then extrapolated or how do you manage that? Well, I mean, so that's a, you know, that's a very uh, valid question. I, I mean, I would say um, that the temporal component doesn't matter so much. I mean, you're not looking for the same, let's say you've got a small lesion, um, which at one hour has uh, less uptake um, compared to it does um, com compared to, let's say, four hours or something like that. Um, I don't see that really being much of a problem, and I've showed that in various simulations and um, on clinical data. Um, you know, it, it, and and actually, you know, this has been used in um, uh, in sort of pet reconstructions of uh, low count sort of static frames where dynamic frames are, um, are summed together. So obviously, if you sum ten seconds worth of data together. Um, you, you know, you've got structures appearing in that data that don't appear in the single frame that you're trying to reconstruct. Um, it just so happens that if the structure in that summed, uh, summed bit of data exists, then it can be used to regularize and inform the static frame reconstruction. Um, so it's, I mean, it's really quite, quite neat. I mean, of course, the problem with clinical data is, and the problem with, um, you know, the data that I used in the paper um, that I published is that they were acquired um, basically a month apart, the PET right, and right. SPECT. Um, so actually in this case, we the because of the longer half-life of copper 64, um, we have the one, four and 24 hours copper 64 data, PET data. And then we have the one, four, 24 and 96 hours of SPECT data. So really I'm using the one hour pet to guide the one hour spec and then oh. the four hour pet to guide the four hour spec. Um, but really the issue is, um, I, I guess- a whole body scanner, you should be able to uh, be able to use it for the whole length of the time because your sensitivity of yeah. your is gonna go up, right? And but, but yeah, but not only that, this is what really excites me is that um, I think that there's um, the total body PET, um, which we are getting at Royal North Shore Hospital, which is a big deal. Um, I think there'll be a sweet spot there where you can image in, uh, you can image a time point with both PET and SPECT. So, um, so I've done um, for the ANZ SNM conference earlier this year. I did a um, a poster on a phantom experiment where I um, used a dual basically a dual injection of lutetium and gallium. Um, so lutetium 177 and gallium 68. And of course, you know, with the, um, with a large amount of uh, any positron emitter on board, um, those 511 kV gammas, they just tear straight through the collimator. So you get this noisy, you know, so when you image on the spec system with, with gallium 68 on board, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to do anything with that data. But, you know, as that decays, because it's got a 68 minute half-life um, and lutetium 177 remains, um, you can then start to image inspect and then use the one hour gallium 68 as a priori information in your um, spectra reconstruction. But with the higher sensitivity, 
Um, oh, and also I'll, I'll make a comment that um, we also showed that, you know, as long as you had a standard in the field of view for the pet reconstruction, the, the large presence of lutetium 177 um, characteristic gammas, um, it does contribute to dead time for the, for the pet system, um, but the images are still perfect. Um, it's just you have to account, uh, account for a, a minor reduction in quantitative accuracy. Um, but with the um, total body PET, I mean, I could imagine a situation where um, you have a lower injected dose of um, your PET radio label pharmaceutical, um, and then you have a therapeutic sort of dose of lutetium or copper 67. And, um, you know, I think there's quite a few sweet points in, in the early hours of imaging where you could get a um, pet image and a spec image at the same time. So let's say you you would put them on the pet bed and then you put them on the spec system and you've got this great high resolution pet image and this noisy, blurry, you know, sort of spec data. Um, yeah, so I, I can imagine um, the, this sort of dual injection approach um, sort of being simultaneous pet and spec imaging and then using the pet, um, pet data as a priori information. Right. Well, so I, I think that's quite it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Theranostic is, is, you know, is largely a spec phenomenon. I mean, most of the theranostic agents are are uh, are, are really um, From single uh, photon emitters. emitters or bremsstrahlung emitters. I mean, do you think you could do this with bremsstrahlung? Certainly. I mean, um, actually. Dr. Daniel Deida, he just um, presented this year, um, a couple of weeks ago at um, the MIC conference. And he was actually using Bremstralung spec imaging of Y90 to yes. guide um, using the same algorithm, which he wrote um, or implemented in STIR and developed um, to guide the reconstruction of Y90 PET imaging, which is sort of the other way around. Um, just because you know the 32 positrons for every 1 million decays um, for Y90. So you get really low count data. Right. Um, but he um so and he showed some success with that. Um, but a lot of the when I watched it live, a lot of the comments um, you know, from other professors who who have implemented similar reconstruction algorithms, they said, Oh, why don't you use the PET to guide the SPECT? And he and you know. He knows that that's what we did. He was he was on my paper, so um, I think, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's um, really an exciting space to sort of um, functional uh, data, you know, emission tomography data to guide, um, you know, other emission tomography data because you're essentially looking at the same thing. Yes, it'd be great if we could get rid of those bloody collimators. That would fix everything, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sensitivity, everything, you know, it would all go up. <laughs> yeah, so so I think the, um, uh, the, the but yeah, but it, but it does mean that we can combine bind those those imaging, particularly now that we've got pretty much pretty much the pairs. The comet chemistry is the one that's you know, because a lot of that was developed in Melbourne, the the original mm. copper chemistry, and that's being used in more than just sartate now. Yeah, so. so um, we're looking. I mean, they are using the same methods to look for breast cancer therapeutics, and and uh, I mean, almost any kind of oncology now. And I think they're thinking about about doing that. Yeah, I mean, uh, another. I mean, it's a shame if people could see the pictures. Where would that people see the pictures? What you've done? How that made a difference? Where, what's the best reference for them to see the pictures? Um, well, the best reference online is probably uh, my. Uh, the, the paper I published in the uh, physics journal, uh, the European Journal of Molecular, uh, of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging Physics. So that was published in February of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, and there's some, I've got some great simulation um, images um, that I've done that anyone who wanted to email me, um, I could show them. But, you know, of course, simulated data is always, you know, it's very easy to do amazing things with simulated data because, you know, um, co-registration and stuff, you know, can be a difficulty. Um, yeah, but yeah, probably my um, uh, European journal um, paper, you, you, right. you see some nice phantom images, yeah. Right. And often in spec, you put a reference source next to the head to, to try and mm. 
um, um, uh, calibrates your, your uptake. But mm. um, do you think you can use whole body PET because you're counting 100% of what activity was injected? You can look at the biological distribution. Um, do you think you can sort of uh, use that to improve your quantitative analysis, if you like, um, of of uh, of your uh, of your uptake? Um, uh, do things like arterial input functions and and whole body mm. to, to help improve your dosimetry that way. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, of course, I mean, if you're looking at spec data, you are looking at the receptors that have uptake, uh, that have taken up the single photon emitting radio label. So you would always want to do, um, uh, you know, you, you, uh, quantitative, if you're using, let's say, whole body, total body PET images as a pro a priori information to guide your spec reconstructions, you would still want to do your separate quantification on the spec data using um, uh, reference standards in the field of view and, and stuff like that. Right. Um, because the other thing as well is that, um, you know, let's say in the future there were uh, this dual injection approach was, um, uh, was explored or investigated um you know I, I i doubt it would be some injection of a mixture of the two um, it would probably probably be separate you know injections um but yeah no i mean of course the, the, that's very interesting um quantification with total body pet because you're getting basically the whole signal yes it's very interesting yeah yeah there's lots of ways there's synergy between all of these things i think and uh but i mean the, the quality of the images you produced were extraordinary. And what's more, they're probably pretty quantitative because you haven't got that anatomical bias that people have had before when they've mm. tried MR and CT. Mm. Yeah, and, and, you know, the interesting thing about this is that, um, you know, you, you can, you know, depending on the parameters you use of the algorithm, I mean, sure, you can... Uh, create false edges or you know you can imagine situations where the issues arise um but in terms of quantification you know you you're not um the total counts in the field of view never changes no matter what you do with with the parameters um yeah and 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 also the fact that the, the hybrid component of this algorithm so um there's been a lot of um uh, implementations of uh KEM, so kernelized expectation maximization but this hybrid part is really interesting because you're actually using um the update spec image um as uh as the guiding modality as well um so this helps with um issues of uh co-registration or trying to put too much information from your pet into your spec um you're still regularizing it with the image data itself right and okay well, okay what are the what what are we going to get out of doing this what are we going to get out of this in terms of the clinical outcome sure that's a great question um well firstly i mean the whole point of radionuclide therapy is that we give this massive payload of of radiation um you know but the whole the whole purpose of it being you know to deliver radiation um to deliver a large dose to metastatic lesions and, and disease um yet you know if this is the whole purpose of of radionuclide therapy um we don't even bother doing dissymmetry on lesions that's that's because the partial volume effect is so large that we can't even reliably uh, quantify uh, the dose that we deliver to the largest lesions, let alone all the small lesions. So so that's really where this um, where this ends up. You know, um, you know, improving the uh, quantification capabilities um, of the dose that we deliver to lesions, um, and then also prospective. Uh, dosimetry and radionuclide therapy treatment planning. So if we have this high resolution PET image and we say, okay, well, we give, um, you know, 100 megabecquerels of, of copper 64 citate to this patient. Um, and, uh, you know, this is the, the dose that's given to the kidneys and, you know, uh, this lesion gets that, this lesion gets that, so on and so on. Um, and then we do the SPECT copper 67 therapy. Well, we don't even, you know, we don't even really know what's happening. We just do kidney dissymmetry and maybe liver dissymmetry or, you know, bone marrow dissymmetry. Um, but if we can sort of um, reliably say, well, 
based off the pre-therapy PET imaging and multi-sequential imaging, if we can say, well, if we give 10 gigabecquels of copper 67 sartate, we're going to give this lesion and that lesion uh, an overall dose of this. So, so it's, it's really sort of opening opening the gateway to treatment planning in radionuclide therapy instead of this one with radiotherapy, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Radiotherapy is always about, you know, aiming for a cure, aiming for a, du a durable um, uh, remission. And, mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't give enough, then you're not going to do that. If you give too much, then you knock off the kidneys or whatever else. So, so you need to, you know, if we're going to in many ways replace or, um, Produce radiotherapy in 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 cancers that pre previously were untreatable, and and we've seen that with prostate cancer, we've seen that with neuroendocrine tumours. Hopefully, we'll see that in breast cancer, and, and maybe we'll see that in brain tumours as well. Um, mm. Then um, and melanoma and so on. I mean, we've got therapies along those lines. Isn't that where we want to be going? So that turns us into not an imaging modality, but a therapeutic modality. And that means that we need to upskill ourselves and get those things right. Yeah, I mean, totally. I mean, yeah, it just sort of, um, it's just amazing to me that, um, yeah, that, 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 that basically the sole purpose of radionuclide therapy is to deliver d dose to lesions and yet we don't quantify the dose we give to lesions. And that's because of the poor spatial resolution. Yeah. And and really, this theranostic paradigm is really opening things up. You know, it's yeah. Well, let's yeah. Fix it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Let's fix it then. Let's do it. Let's get on yeah. and do it. And that you need more sites to do that, right? Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to say to 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 get other people on board or do stuff? Um. Uh, not really. I guess one other thing I'd mention, um, you know, because we were talking about spect uh, single photon emitting radio labels being sort of the the um, sort of main powerhouse of, of um, therapies um, in nuclear medicine. Um, but our group, um, so Dr. Yasa Galami and uh, fellow PhD candidate Takanori Hioki, um, they're looking at um, what, uh, what we've termed uh, PERTS, so positron emitting uh, radio, radionuclide therapy. Yep. Um, so the, the basis behind that being that um, positron emitting isotopes have been overlooked uh, as a potential for uh, uh, therapeutic radionuclides. So um, there was a paper published, I believe earlier this year um, by uh, Takanori. Um, so looking at um, sort of uh, in vitro uh, cell stuff for positron emitters. Um, anyway, so that's very exciting. So, I mean, we can, uh, our group can certainly see a future where maybe positron emitters um, are included in sort of um, radionuclide therapies. Yeah. Which, I mean, which, I mean, you can imagine how exciting that would be um, if you gave a therapeutic um, dose of uh, a positron em emitter and you put them on the total body PET scan, um, you would need to image them for like five seconds. <laughs> put them on, take them off. You know, if, you, if, you, if you've got 10 times of the activity on board and 40 times greater sensitivity, yeah, that's it. You wouldn't like, need a whole body scanner. You could just, uh, you just, yeah. just, just turn your scanner up to high speed and just... <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah. And, and, and you could back. image them from space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, you might end up in dead time area problems, but... Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, but I think it, it does mean that, that, that you can then uh, image later when there's some been some decay as well, I guess. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, no, I think that's the way to go, and uh, and uh, I think this is a great story. Um, mm, thank well, you. Um, thanks for taking part in the podcast. Nothing else you'd like to say uh, apart from that? No. Good. Uh, no, just, just thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Thank it's you. been a pleasure having you on.